In the heart of Central Europe, in the middle of a deep, dark forest, lies a mountain range that changed the world. It's smaller than the Alps, less dramatic than the Dolomites, and far less romantic than the Carpathians. And yet, its place in modern European history is so vast, so great, that its reputation could dwarf even the Himalayas. Known as the Sudetes, this borderland between the forests of Germany and the hills of the Czech Republic may not be famous, but the region around it certainly is. In 1938, the Sudetes land helped plunge Europe into war. An ancient meeting place where the Germanic peoples of Central Europe mingled with the Slavic peoples of the East, the Sudetenland was for centuries a world of cooperation, multiculturalism, and harmony. Yet in the 20th century, its residents embraced Nazi nationalism with horrific consequences for everyone. Shrouded by mist, stained by violence, and still sprawling across one of Europe's deepest fault lines, this is the story of the Sudetenland, the birthplace of World War II. If you were a European king in the early Middle Ages, and if you were, congratulations on surviving this long, there was nothing you wanted more than a kingdom surrounded by deep, impenetrable forest. This was because deep, impenetrable forests were exactly the sort of thing that kept marauding armies at bay. So it's no surprise that early Czech kings of Bohemia set up shop near the Sudetenland, a region of deep forests and rugged mountains that acted as the early Middle Ages equivalent of an actual border. But Ottokar II had a problem. He wasn't a king in the early Middle Ages, he was a king in the High Middle Ages. And in the High Middle Ages, deep impenetrable forests were very out of vogue. In vogue was having enough subjects to set up skilled industries and pay taxes. So what's a king with too few subjects and a great semi-useless stretch of impenetrable forest to do? Well, that's easy. Ottokar II invited German speakers from all across the Holy Roman Empire to come and populate his Sudetenland. Now if you're expecting to hear of the arrival of hordes of Beerstein wielding Germans upset the Czech residents of Bohemia, well, you'd be wrong. Ottokar's new German subjects, they were skilled craftsmen, tradespeople, rich merchants, etc. In short, they were a welcome minority, but events they were about to unfold, which meant the Germans wouldn't be a minority for very long. In 1526, the Bohemian crown passed to a guy called Ferdinand I. A member of the Austrian Habsburgs, Ferdinand was a hands-off sort of ruler. He allowed the Czech nobles in Bohemia to do their own thing. But the rest of his family, well, that was another matter. The Habsburgs were generally German-speaking die-hard Catholics, while the Czech nobility was generally not. This was all fine, so long as a bunch of riled up Czech Protestant nobles didn't get into their heads to hurl two Catholics out of a Prague castle window into a gigantic pile of manure. It wasn't really a big ask, was it? The 1618 defenestration of Prague it didn't just end with two Catholics and a pile of dung, it ended with the Thirty Year War, a titanic conflict that devastated Central Europe. For the purposes of our story, it also ended with the Czech Protestants rising up against their Catholic overlords, an uprising that went very badly for the Czechs. On November 8, 1620, the Habsburg armies faced off against the Winter King at the Battle of White Mountain. While that probably sounds like the sort of epic battle you're used to seeing on Game of Thrones, the reality was it was pretty one-sided. The Habsburgs, they absolutely crushed the Czechs. They crushed them like the Incredible Hulk belly flopping onto a stack of china. <laughs> In the aftermath of the Czech nobility, they were given the boot. The Habsburgs tightened their grip on power, and the Germans went from a minority to the guys calling the shots. Come the 18th century, Czech was only spoken by villagers and field workers. While not everyone who spoke German was ethnically German, this did make the proper Germans in the Sudetenland feel important and powerful, and they liked the way this world was working. It was a feeling that was only enhanced when the brand new Austrian Empire absorbed Bohemia at the beginning of the 19th century. But those comfortable Sudeten Germans, they would soon be in for a rude awakening. If you've ever read a book on 19th century European history, you will know that everything keeps coming back to one year. 
1848. That's because 1848 is the year that Europe exploded. The actual ins and outs are far too complex for us to go into today, but the super abridged version is that a revolution in France in February ignited a similar revolution in Austria, which caused the whole of the continent to pick up pitchforks and overthrow the system. In Bohemia, the sight of Austria paralyzed by revolts sent Czech nationalism absolutely nuclear. Under a guy called František Palatsky, the Czech national movement swept through Prague, demanding autonomy for Bohemia and equal rights for the fading Czech language. And there's something really important to note here. Palatsky was calling for equal rights, not the complete replacement of the widely spoken German language. Palatsky even invited Sudeten German delegates to his Prague National Congress so they could all hammer out an agreement on what their autonomous Bohemia should look like. In any other year, it could have been a tale of brotherhood and cooperation. Unfortunately, 1848 wasn't any other year. It was the year Europe caught fire. And Germany was burning too. To the north of Bohemia, the German-speaking lands had spent the last few decades as a loose confederation of 39 states, imaginatively called the German Confederation. But with kings falling and the waft of gunpowder in Europe's streets, the confederation it decided 1848 would be the perfect time for uniting into a single nation called Germany. This Germany would include all lands where German was spoken, a utopia for Germans everywhere. There was just one teeny tiny problem. Bohemia was one of those lands. When Palatsky got the invite to join the German National Congress, he was like all, huh, oh, you're serious? Uh, no. But joining the Congress was exactly what the Sudeten Germans wanted, so they sent delegates on Bohemia's behalf. You could almost call this the first Sudeten crisis. In Prague, the Czechs were meeting to establish a new Bohemia, with Slavic peoples at the heart of it. In Frankfurt, the Sudeten Germans were meeting to try and drag Bohemia into a country called Germany. The only reason these competing revolutions didn't erupt into civil war was that Prince Windischgratz got there first. Prince Windischgratz was Bohemian by birth and German by origin, but by temperament he was a fanatically loyal Habsburg army officer. And the Habsburgs weren't about to let Bohemia fall to the Czechs or to the Germans. In June of 1848, Windischgratz surrounded Prague and bombed the city into submission. Under the constant shelling, the Czechs were forced to discard their dreams of a Slavic Bohemia. Not long after, the Sudeten Germans they were forced to discard their hopes as well. Although the 1848 revolutions ended with Bohemia still under the Austrians, things had changed. No longer could anyone pretend Czechs and Germans were living happily together. The competing congresses had drawn ethnic lines in the sand, separating neighbors. As the 19th century rumbled on and the Czech language experienced a revival, separate schools and universities started to appear. People started to see each other as separate, almost as rivals. So long as the Austrian Empire, now reorganized into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, remained standing, there would always be another Windischgratz to bomb everyone into line. But the winds of change were blowing across Europe, and soon the empire would come crashing down. There's a classic question kids like to ask. How many people could you kill with a single bullet? And the answer to that question is not as many as Gavrilo Princip. On the 28th of June 1914, Princip was stood on a street corner in Sarajevo in Bosnia, waiting to meet royalty. It was now decades since the upheavals of 1848, and a great deal had changed. 750 kilometers away in Bohemia, the revival of the Czech language had become a frenzy. As villagers poured into the cities, German and Germans were once again relegated to minorities. But Princip, he wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking about how the Habsburgs had just annexed Bosnia into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was thinking about how this was an act of piracy that required vengeance. And Princip was going to be the man to deliver it. That hot day, the heir to the Austrian throne, Franz Ferdinand, was in Sarajevo on a visit. As his motorgate drove past Princip, the young man raised his pistol and fired the shot that would kill millions. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand was the shove that toppled the precarious house of cards called Europe. The collapse of those cards, well, that's better known as World War I, and it killed 20 million people. It also killed the Austro-Hungarian Empire. By 1918, the forces of nationalism unleashed by 1848 hadn't gone away. When it became clear the empire was losing World War I, all its many minorities, they made a break for freedom. The first split happened right back in Bohemia. On October the 28th, 1918, the Czechs in Prague unilaterally declared independence from Austria. 
Within 24 hours, other parts of the disintegrating empire they were breaking off. Among them were the Slovaks, who wound up joining the Czechs in something called Czechoslovakia. But there were others trying to shape a rather different future. On October the 30th, a group of German speakers in Austria declared the creation of another new nation, German Austria. Comprising all of the German-speaking regions of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it included Austria proper, but also the Sudetenland. At that time, the Sudetenland was home to over 3 million Germans. In some regions, over 90% of the locals were German. But across the Sudetenland as a whole, that figure fell to only a little over 25%. The rest were a mix of Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, and Jews. So when German Austria tried to claim the Sudetenland, the Czech army said, uh, no. The Czech occupation of the Sudetenland caused uproar among Bohemia's Germans. They demanded the right to self-determination to be absorbed into German Austria or Germany itself. When German Austria held its first elections on March 1, 1919, the Sudeten Germans protested to be allowed to take part. The Czech authorities responded with bullets. Finally, in September of 1919, the Allies settled the issue with the Treaty of Saint-Germain. The treaty annulled all Austrian claims to the Sudetenland. Just like that, the region became a part of Czechoslovakia. For those who lived there, it was a painful blow. From a favored minority in a Germanic empire, the Sudeten Germans suddenly went to outsiders in the land of Czechs and Slovaks. That outsider status it was confirmed when an official Czechoslovak assembly was called in February of 1920 to write the new constitution. Only Czechs and Slovaks were invited. Locked out in the cold, the Sudeten Germans could only shiver and rage at the injustice. In this new Czechoslovakia, Slovaks made up 16% of the population, Czechs 50%, and Germans made up 22.3%. They were the second largest group, and yet here they were, unable to even help craft the constitution. It was deeply unfair, and it was also something that the Czechoslovaks would soon come to regret. The early history of the first Czechoslovak Republic is one of compromises and promises unkept. The president, Tomáš Masaryk, initially envisaged a Swiss-style federal system that would allow each ethnic group a degree of autonomy. Instead, the republic wound up a highly centralized state governed from Prague. For the Germans, this was yet another slap in the face. Across the Sudetenland, it became policy to treat the government in Prague as illegitimate. Yet we'd be lying if we said Czechoslovakia's Germans were treated badly. Yes, they'd been barred from drawing up the constitution, but the constitution that emerged had been respectful of German rights. Nor was every German living in Czechoslovakia jumping at the bit to secede. In cities like Brno, Germans, Czechs, and Jews all lived side side by side as peacefully as they had for centuries. By 1925, there were even signs that a wider cooperation might be possible. That year, the Pact of Locarno formalized relations between Germany and Czechoslovakia. In the Sudetenland, political leaders began softening their separatist stances. When the November election returned a divided parliament, two German parties even officially joined the Czechoslovak government. In another universe, this could have been the start of something, a journey that would end with the Sudeten Germans fully integrating into Czechoslovakia. But sadly, we don't live in another universe. And in this universe, the 1920s ended with a catastrophe that destroyed all hopes of integration. The Wall Street crash was the miserable herald of a miserable and hungry decade. In Czechoslovakia, that misery and hunger was concentrated mostly in the Sudetenland's industrial cities. While the government in Prague initiated a program of unemployment relief, it didn't do nearly enough for these stricken German towns. The unfortunate result was that the Germans felt the Czechoslovak government was helping Czechs and Slovaks at the expense of the drowning Sudetenland. It was a feeling that gave birth to resentment, that in turn gave birth to a monster. That monster's name it was Konrad Henlein. A former gymnastics coach, Henlein was the Sudetenland's number one fanboy of Adolf Hitler. In 1933, Henlein decided to bring the Sudetenland its own fascist party, one that could capitalize on all of that misery and resentment. That May, the Sudeten German Homeland Movement was born. A bunch of SS wannabes, the Homeland Movement was brash, anti Semitic, and openly fascist. It was also very violent. As Henlein's power grew over the Sudetenland's disaffected Germans, so too did violence against moderates. Before long, refusing to support Henlein in the Sudetenland was the quickest route you could take to having your head caved in by a bunch of Aryan nutjobs. By the time Henlein's now renamed Sudeten German Party contested the 1935 elections, he held the region in an iron grip. The returns were a wake-up call to Prague. 
Henlein pulled down two-thirds of the German vote, around 1.2 million people. No other party in the whole of Czechoslovakia did so well. It was only thanks to the way seats were distributed that Henlein didn't win outright, instead netting 44 seats to the Agrarian Party's 44. For Henlein, it was all the mandate he needed. In the Sudetenland, the party took over the levers of power, effectively killing democracy. While Czechoslovakia itself was still democratic, it now carried a fascist tumor that poisoned its politics and made it sick. In three short years, that tumor it would kill Czechoslovakia entirely. On the 5th of November 1937, Adolf Hitler informed his generals of his plan to annex the Sudetenland. Just two weeks later, Konrad Hanlein traveled to Germany and met with Hitler in private. If the Fuhrer wanted to conquer the Sudetenlands, then Hanlein would help him do it. It was a momentous meeting. But it was also inevitable. Since 1936, the German intelligence agency, the Abwehr, had been meddling in the Sudetenland. Nazi propaganda was being smuggled into the region. Meanwhile, Henlein's goons had snuffed out the last vestiges of opposition. The Czechoslovaks could see the conflagration coming. Prague was in firefighting mode, offering concessions to the Sudetenlands that no other regions were allowed. But it was too little, too late. In March 1938, Nazi tanks rolled into Austria, annexing it into Germany proper. For Henlein, it was the propaganda coup that he needed. Seeing the peaceful Anschluss bring the Austrians into a Germany that was economically booming and feared on the world stage sent the Sudetenland into a frenzy. Henlein began making Hitler-esque speeches, demanding full autonomy within Czechoslovakia. When local elections were held a month later, his fascist party pulled down 90% of the German vote. Standing on the sidelines, Britain and France watched the crisis unfolding with visible discomfort. Both countries liked to style themselves as the adults of Europe, the ones who were there to stop bullies like Germany from beating on the smaller nations. But now that the moment had come to act, they were simply too scared. Their hesitation it only made the Sudeten crisis worse. That September, Henlein unilaterally seceded from Czechoslovakia. In the chaos that followed, the Czechs branded Henlein a traitor and issued an arrest warrant. But Henlein fled into Germany, from where he began directing terrorist raids into Bohemia. In just a few short days, over 100 Czechs were murdered. As Hitler geared up for invasion, France and Britain they reluctantly prepared to go to war. The fact that they didn't is due to Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain's name today is synonymous with hand-wringing appeasement in the face of evil. Yet, at the time, his actions they almost made sense. Chamberlain had been in his 30s when World War I broke out, and he knew firsthand the carnage that could be unleashed by another European conflict. Maybe Henlein kind of had a point. One of the major themes of the post-World War I settlement had been self-determination for all peoples. The Sudeten Germans they wanted to join Germany? Well, who was Chamberlain to say no? On September the 21st, Chamberlain met with Hitler to see if war could be avoided. By now, the government in Prague had caved to all of Henlein's demands, but Hitler was still determined to fight. It took all of Chamberlain's diplomatic skill to get the Fuhrer to agree to a conference in Munich a week later. There, Britain, France, Italy, and Germany decided that the Sudetenlands should go to Germany. No Czechoslovak delegates were invited. Just like the Sudeten Germans during the drawing up of the Czechoslovak constitution, the Czechs were left shivering outside in the cold. On October 1, 1938, Nazi troops entered the Sudetenland, annexing it into Germany. The day before, Neville Chamberlain had stood before a crowd in Britain and proudly declared that the Munich Agreement meant peace for our time. Not six months later, on March 15, 1939, Hitler annexed the rest of Bohemia and the Czech region of Moravia. By then, no one could think of Chamberlain's words without issuing a hollow laugh. Although the Sudetenland didn't wind up being the flashpoint for World War II, it did force the French and British to consider their approaches to Hitler. So when Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, there was no more pussyfooting around. The two nations, they declared war, and the rest, as they say, is history. But what of the Sudetenland itself? In the early stages of World War II, life in the Sudetenlands was actually kind of fine. Even the Czechs living there were treated lightly by the Nazis, who considered them both essential workers and possible candidates for Aryanization. The one discordant note was the fate of the region's Jews. For centuries, Jews living in the Sudetenland had identified themselves as Czech or German first and Jewish second. Now, even those who considered themselves Germans were suddenly targets. Over the next few years, nearly all of them would disappear into the inferno of the Holocaust. 
Yet even as World War II got rolling, the default assumption was that any future Czechoslovak state would have had a place for the Sudeten Germans. Although the Czechoslovak leader in exile, Edvard Beneš, floated the idea of a Czechoslovakia without a German minority, no one thought it would happen. There had been Germans in the Sudetenland for centuries. That calculation it changed on June 10, 1942. Two weeks earlier, Czechoslovak partisans had assassinated the high-ranking Nazi Reinhard Heydrich in Prague. Hitler had sworn a day of bloodshed in revenge and well, now that day was here. That morning, SS soldiers marched into the randomly chosen Czech village of Lidice. They dragged all the men and boys from their homes and shot them. They killed all the animals. They burned down all the houses. When it was over, they deported the women and girls to extermination camps to be gassed. The Lidice massacre was so brutal, it destroyed any chance of reconciliation in the Sudetenland. By October 1943, Edvard Benesch was able to declare, What the Germans have done in our land since 1938 will be revenged on them multifold and mercilessly. Sergei Inger, the commander-in-chief of Czech forces in England, for his part said of the Sudeten Germans, Beat them, kill them, let nobody survive. For now, these were mere words, empty threats against the Nazi war machine. But memories of Lidice lingered. By the time 1945 rolled around, the Czechs were keen to get their revenge. On May 8, 1945, the last German forces in Czechoslovakia finally surrendered. The very next day, vigilante groups began to gather in towns and cities across the country. Comprising of Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, and a handful of surviving Jews, the groups had one thing on their minds. They were going to find the treacherous Germans who'd invited Hitler into the Sudetenland, and they were going to make them pay. Over the next two months, vigilante groups targeted ethnic Germans with homicidal intensity. At the more ordered end of the scale, the city of Brno forcibly marched its 20,000 German inhabitants into Austria, an event that killed 500 people. At the most anarchic end, 2,000 Germans from the town of Jartetz and Postelopriti were forced to dig their own graves before all were shot dead. It was the same terrorizing tactics the Nazis had unleashed on Europe for the last six years turned back on the Sudeten Germans. Never mind that not every Sudeten German had supported Henlein. Never mind that children and even committed anti-Nazis were caught up in the atrocities. This was vengeance on a colossal scale, a national psychosis driven by a deep fury. And it wouldn't let up until there were no Germans left. On August the 1st, the Potsdam Conference authorized the Czechoslovak government to expel all the Sudeten Germans from their homelands. This brought to an end the so-called wild expulsions, replacing them with official transports and internment camps. But the brutality? It didn't let up. From their return from exile until the end of 1947, the Czechoslovak government deported millions of Sudeten Germans. In the last days of peace back in 1938, there had been 3.5 million Germans living in the Sudetenland. After the expulsions were halted in 1947, that number had been reduced to a mere 170,000. The final death toll of the expulsion of the Sudeten Germans was 6,000 murdered, 6,000 suicides, and between 25,000 and 30,000 killed by exhaustion, disease, or exposure. Further, over 3 million people had been turned into refugees, dumped into a war-shattered Germany. The few Sudeten Germans who did remain were those who could prove that they'd fought against the Nazis, or those who had the good fortune to be married to Czechs. It wasn't the worst atrocity in Central European history. When neighboring Poland expelled their Germans, it's thought 430,000 died. Even this number, though, it just pales in comparison to Nazi atrocities. The expulsion of Germans from Czechoslovakia it had consequences. The most immediate was the death of the Sudetenland. From a unique microculture with a tradition stretching back centuries, the Sudetenland became just another Czech region in Bohemia. Sure, the region itself remained, complete with its mountains and deep impenetrable forests, but the thing that had made it a region worth knowing about, the glue that had held its unique culture together, it had gone. Today, there are barely 40,000 descendants of the Sudeten Germans living in the Czech Republic. While the ghosts of the past still haunt towns like Cheb or Zatadz in the form of Germanic architecture, most traces of the millions of Germans who once lived out their lives here are long gone. All their hopes, all their fears, all their families, all their businesses, it's just nothing but dust. Footnotes, if they're lucky, on some small plaque that no one ever reads. Yet, for better or for worse, the Sudetenland's place in history is assured. 
It was here that the first rumblings were felt of a war that would shatter the world. Here that decisions were taken that would set Hitler on a path of conquest. It's by no means a happy history. It's not something you learn about to comfort yourself before falling asleep at night. But the Sudetenland's past is a vital history, and one that deserves to be remembered. In its own small way, that vitality ensures those who once lived here, whether they were Czech, German, or Jewish, will never be forgotten. So on that note, like we said, this is not really one of those videos you enjoy, but if you did find it informative, if you learned a little bit about this place, this part of history, please give it a thumbs up below. And if you want more stuff like this from us, do subscribe, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you next time.